A.J. Roberts is a molecular biologist and research scholar at Reasons to Believe. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Tulsa, a PhD in Molecular and Cell Biology from the University of Pennsylvania, and a Master of Arts in Christian Apologetics from Biola University. AJ puts her passion for truth to work, engaging in science-faith topics such as evolution and design, harmonizing science and Christianity, and a theological perspective on viruses. It's time to change our outlook on evil. Please welcome A.J. Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. And good morning. You know, as I was listening to Abdu talk, and you really only had to hear his conclusion, I heard two truth claims that are shared by the old man in the country, by Billy Currington, where the chorus goes like this. God is great, beer is good, and people are crazy. <laughs> I hope you heard too as well. Uh, but I'm amazed, as Abdu was suggesting, how we accept truth claims in popular culture, regardless of what they are. Is beer good? Does it depend on the time of day, the day of the week, the nutritional value, the quantity, the taste? Are people crazy? Is it worth challenging these truth claims? Well, what about these claims? God is great. God is good. I've known these claims since I was a child and learned to pray, God is great, God is good, at the dinner table. But it didn't take long, I didn't have to be very old, I didn't have to go very far from the table before those truth claims were deeply challenged. There's evil and suffering all around us. And those, the problem of evil, the problem of suffering may be the greatest apologetic we face today. It may be the greatest personal challenge we face today. Because if God is great, if God is good, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world around us? To the critic who raises the challenge of the problem of evil, he is challenging the power of the very existence of God as well as the goodness of God, the love of God, and the trustworthiness of God. But the problem of evil is not unique to the Christian. The problem of evil must be addressed by every worldview and every religion. And although some religions wrestle deeply with the problem of evil and suffering, they offer no real solution. They leave their adherents repeating endless cycles of life trying to get it right. Or they leave us abandoned to a distant or a capricious God. Naturalism gives no real solution to the problem of evil. Now the challenge to the Judeo-Christian claims of God's impeccable goodness and God's omnipotence have been raised ever since these claims were first made. And over two millennia, countless theologians and countless philosophers have tried to address the problem of evil. So let's acknowledge in dialogue that the advantage belongs to the critic, because the critic can easily raise the problem of evil succinctly, simply, and quickly. And the question of the problem of evil cannot be addressed either simply or quickly or easily, as two millennia and countless publications suggest. But I believe that the Christian worldview gives us the most comprehensive and satisfying answers to the problem of evil. I do not want to overpromise today, in light of two millennia of wrestling with this problem, that I'm going to give you definitive answers to the problem of evil. But what I hope that we will accomplish in the next half hour is that I will give you some examples from natural evil as to why an all-powerful and good God would permit evil, and then I'm gonna ask us to consider how we might even revise our thinking in regard to the problem of evil in light of not just evil, but human pain and suffering. So I will not be addressing the problem of moral evil or man's inhumanity to man, and yet I think this too has a remedy in the life, work, death, resurrection of Jesus and in the power of God to transform the human heart. But let's review one of those earlier truth claims that I made. In light of evil and suffering, what do you think of? What do you feel when you hear me say, God is good? Well, good is a purpose or value-laden word. To render judgment of something as good doesn't just entail knowledge of the action or the behavior, but knowledge of the intent, or the purpose, 
and the outcome. And this leads us to what I consider our first recurring and obstinate obstacle to addressing the problem of evil, and that's that we suffer from human finitude. We have limited perspective. We have limited knowledge. And perhaps due to our limitations, we rush to judge something superficially because we don't completely understand the merit or the value of what's going on. Now, John Pollock is an American philosopher known for influential work in theory of knowledge and artificial intelligence, and he refers to our problem of finitude this way. He says, there are, what you know is orders of magnitude less than what is true. And I'm not singling you out. What I know, the total sum of human knowledge, is orders of magnitude less than what is true. We know so little about what can be known about nature and reality. You know, Shakespeare, through the words of Hamlet, actually penned this centuries earlier when he said, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And really, Pollock and Shakespeare are just echoing the very thoughts of God, spoken through the prophet Isaiah, where he says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So reflecting on our finitude, on our limitations, our limited perspective, we still have to navigate life in light of this sort of prevailing ignorance that Pollock refers to. I would suggest that we keep two questions in mind as we move on. What if our prevailing ignorance is the primary reason we quickly dub things as bad or evil. What if things we principally see as bad are often just failures to see a hidden or unseen good? Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's no such thing as evil, but I'm gonna try and back up these claims with some examples from science and history and scripture. And if I'm successful, we're actually going to need to revise the way that we think about these things. And might I suggest that belief revision is not something to be fearful of. In fact, it is a principal scientific virtue, along with pursuing truth and sharing knowledge. And so, if I'm successful in the next half hour, we're gonna get, be given the opportunity to revise the way that we think. And may I suggest that we approach that invitation with humility in light of our limited perspective and with courage, as we consider now, just for briefly, a few examples of evil, what are referred to as natural evil in the world around us. Now, natural evil is really just a philosophical or a theological term to describe natural disasters like these. Natural disasters or diseases that seemingly challenge the goodness or the power of God. Now, I'm a molecular biologist, so I'm going to start with the big red bubbles, uh, epidemics. Whether bacterial or viral epidemics, Diseases are one of the most widespread and difficult to avoid and devastating encounters of nature that we experience. It's one of the greatest forms of natural evil. We don't have to go very far before we recognize throughout history things like the plague exemplify this. 60%, 60% of the European population was wiped out by the Black Death in the 14th century. And throughout human history, we are ravaged by continual outbreaks. HIV has killed more than 17 million people to date, and 70 million people are walking around infected. Influenza, tuberculosis, malaria, cholera. Surely these bacterial and viral diseases challenge the absurd idea that creation is good, and by extrapolation, they're a critique on the supposed goodness of a creator. Well, historically, bacteria and viruses were first experienced in the context of devastating and horrifying diseases like the plague. But through scientific studies over the last several decades, we've, we've known that bacteria are critical for sustaining life, and actually even human life and human flourishing. Through processes like decomposition and nutrient recycling, 
through our human metabolism, where our bodies have as many bacterial cells as they do human cells. But even more fundamental than that, bacteria are what's known as primary producers. And these are fundamental for life on Earth in our ecosystem at individual levels. Now, primary producers are those things that can take inorganic compounds and turn them into organic foodstuffs that other organisms can use. This primarily happens through a process called photosynthesis generated by the sun's energy. It can also happen through chemosynthesis generated by chemical reactions. Now, whether it's photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, all of life on planet Earth depends on these fundamental processes. And bacteria are the very foundation and heart of these processes. Now, some of you might recall from ninth grade biology that Plants are also undergoing photosynthesis. The plants are also primary producers. Well, good job for thinking about that. But even plants depend on bacteria because bacteria fix inorganic nitrogen from Earth's atmosphere into organic compounds. Every amino acid in every protein, whether it's a plant or an animal, depends upon this process of nitrogen fixation. So, I hope I've convinced you that bacteria are actually ecosystem superstars. And my slides aren't advancing, uh, but we'll get there soon. <laughs> and whether that's true, whether it's at an ecological... Whoa. That's true, whether it's at an ecological or an individual level. So, bacteria are pretty fantastic. Well, what about viruses? Well, I could convince you that viruses are also extremely good, but that would be a whole nother talk. It's actually the talk that I gave two years ago at AMP, and if you're interested in that, you can download the DVD or pick up a copy of the DVD, uh, and you can also see there that without viruses, life on Earth would not be possible. You could also pick up a copy of Building Bridges, where I talk about it in Chapter 4, Why Would a Good God Create Viruses? Okay, so bacteria and viruses, that wraps up sort of the view of epidemics. But what about other natural disasters, like earthquakes? Well, although one of the most persistent and deadliest forms of natural disasters throughout history, earthquakes need not be so destructive. They need not kill or injure so many people. It is primarily our failure to act with compassion and integrity on the knowledge that we have that causes so much pain and human suffering in the face of these earth-shaking disasters. I expound on these points as well in, a, in another talk available to you online at RTB's YouTube channel. But suffice it to say that with earthquakes, we often rush to judgment again, claiming that something that is actually vitally good and necessary for human flourishing is bad or evil. Hugh comments on this in one of his blogs uh, where he says, if we were to imagine an earth without plate tectonics, we might envision less natural disasters. Fewer tsunamis, fewer earthquakes, fewer volcanic eruptions. Sounds nice, but it would be far more accurate to envision a planet hostile and barren to life, like Mars or Venus. Because Earth's planet-shifting plates provide life-critical effects on a planetary scale. Things such as global thermal regulation, things that help control the carbon dioxide level in our atmosphere that helps protect us from the sun's increasing luminosity. So we definitely misunderstand what's going on around us if we think earthquakes, bacteria, and viruses are primarily bad. The more we learn about the, them through scientific inquiries, the more we discover they're not only good, they are vitally important for human flourishing. So as we understand that things that we superficially judge as bad or evil are, awfully ex are actually extremely good and critical for life on Earth, we see that God's revelation in creation reinforces the Christian view of God as rich in love and in provision. And we now have an answer to some critics' quips as to why a good and powerful God might permit evil in nature. And this gives us confidence that his love and his heart for us is true and great and good, as we see these demonstrations in nature are actually for our human flourishing. And as we grow in confidence in God and God's word, 
I think it will help us to consider that as we turn now to examples of other forms of evil and suffering. And I hope I've given you something to consider that begins to challenge you to belief revision about natural evil. Now, I've not addressed the problem of moral evil, and given more time, I could actually comment on how moral evil exacerbates the effects of natural disasters. It causes more pain and suffering, and more loss of human life. Things like poor construction, building in floodplains, a failure to manage environmental risks, failures to address malnutrition and drought, and misuse of antibiotics. But before we move on, I, I want to encourage you that whenever you're in a conversation, including the conversation we're having today, me from the stage, that we take on huge risks in addressing the problem of evil and pain and suffering. And whether it results from moral evil, individual choices, or acts of nature, I don't want to gloss over the very real pain that many of us experience on a personal level and many, as, many of us observe in the people that we care about and love around us. You know, I have friends and family who suffer from chronic pain, who are battling cancer, who struggle with lifelong mental illness, or who are facing mental deterioration at life's end. So I don't want to gloss over that. But in the next part of the talk, I really want to begin to address the way that we think about suffering and pain. Uh, I want to try to offer us encouragement and possibly help us to think about suffering in a way that may help alleviate some of the unmanageable pain that we experience. And, and may I suggest that we might even benefit from more belief revision in regard to suffering itself. So how can we begin to think about suffering in light of a Christian worldview, a Christ-centered or Christ-informed view of life? Well, I think contemporary theologian N.T. Wright, in a response to suffering, sums it up best. He says the way of Christian witness is not the way of quietist withdrawal, it is not the way of militant zeal, it is the way of being in Christ, in the spirit, at the place where the world is in pain so that the healing love of God may be brought to bear at that point. It's actually very important, I think, to be in prayer at the place where the world is in pain. It's part of our Christian vocation. Now, N.T. Wright's words capture the, one of the greatest truths of Christianity. We are not meant to go it alone. God does not leave us alone in our suffering. Jesus became a man, and he experienced deepest suffering himself. And Jesus promises to never leave us, even in our darkest valleys. And we are adopted into Christian community when we become part of God's family through faith. And we are called to comfort one another with the comfort that we've received from God and with the comfort of God's promises that God will be present with us that he will bring justice and ultimately deliverance. I think we also recognize in N.T. Wright's reflections that in the face of adversity and suffering, some of the deepest human virtues are called forth. Compassion, mercy, courage, hope. When others around us are facing devastation or adversity, we are called to enter into the suffering with them. And we are called to bear the presence of God and the hope of God in order to comfort them. It is not enough just to be compassionate. We must act because it is our actions that minister to the suffering. It is our actions that onlookers observe and both of these categories, the sufferer and the onlooker, see in our actions the heart of a loving and good God. As we bear hope to the suffering, we exemplify acts of courage and compassion that should be the hallmark of all who claim to love Christ and all who claim to follow him. We are to comfort with the comfort that we've received. We are to weep with those who weep. We are to bear one another's burdens. So whenever we observe suffering around us, it's always a call to courage and compassion even at great personal risk or expense. And it demands action, not just sentiment, and it's our actions that are of the most profound importance.
Now, when we personally face or personally experience evil or suffering, we also always have a choice. We have an invitation. How will we respond? And those choices that we make, those responses that we take, are also of great significance. Now, whether a Christian or non-Christian, throughout history and today, many have observed that adversity is, no, is necessary for growing in moral virtue. But as Christians, we believe it has even more profound effects than that. We believe that God works all things together for good. So in the face of adversity, we actually believe that God is growing in us Christ-likeness and a maturity of our faith. As I think more and more deeply of God's goodness and our suffering in parallel, and as I scour the scriptures, I am convinced that God uses suffering and adversity to invite us into deeper trust and deeper realization of his goodness and his heart for us. That he forms in us by the power of the Holy Spirit as free moral agents, individuals who deeply trust in the heart of God, the love of God, and the goodness of God. And when we believe something is ultimately for good, we find that we can endure the process without losing hope. In fact, I think we will even willingly engage in pain and suffering when we believe we will gain from the process, or we, when we believe that the process will accomplish a greater good, and when we believe it's temporary and it won't last forever. I think this is borne out even in simple examples. Whether you're an athlete competing for a prize, or you're a student striving for a better life or to make a contribution to society, whether you're making sacrifices as a mother or a father, we will purposefully enter into adversity, pain, and suffering when we believe it is for a greater good. And we can endure such suffering when we believe it is accomplishing a greater good. And when we believe it's temporary. We will willingly enter into this type of suffering. But you know, some suffering isn't entered into willingly. Some suffering is dropped on us, like a bombshell. Tragic results of our choices or others' choices, effects of more profound moral evil of man's inhumanity to man, or random acts that just hit us from, from nature. But even then, when suffering and adversity and evil is encountered unexpectedly, we have a choice in how will we respond. And that choice and that response can have great effects, not just in our own lives, but in the lives of those around us. In A Grace Disguised, author Jerry Sitzer shares autobiographically of a tragic event that occurred in a single night in his life when he lost his mother, his wife, and his daughter. His entire world and very being was shaken to its core. And I picked up a, a grace disguised on the recommendation of a friend when I was suffering grief and loss as well. And Jerry Sitzer writes a grace disguised for just such a person. And he writes there that tragedy can increase the soul's capacity for darkness and light, for pleasure as well as pain, for hope as well as dejection. Because, and if you recall Phil's talk yesterday, it is in the darkest hour of suffering, when he was quoting MLK Jr., right? It is in the darkest hour of suffering that we often begin to search for the light, for deliverance, and for hope. And it's then when small actions can actually break through as brilliant flashes of light and hope and mercy when we take action to bear the hope of Christ to others. Jerry Sitzer goes on to call the valley of suffering the veil of soul-making, borrowing from poet John Keats, and articulating what is known of as a soul-making process, or a soul-forming process in the face of adversity. This same concept is shared by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was the Nobel laureate in literature in 1970. He writes of his experience in the Soviet gulag system and the experience of 227 fellow prisoners 
He writes of the Gulag system, one of the most heinous systems that existed for over 40 years, subjecting all prisoners of state and society to some of the most dehumanizing conditions imaginable. He spent eight years in the Gulag system and writes this. Bless you, prison. Bless you for being in my life. For there, lying upon the rotting prison straw, I came to realize that the object of life is not prosperity, as we're made to believe, but the maturity of the human soul. Now, this idea of soul forming or soul making has Christian and non-Christian adherents, and it's nothing new. It dates back at least to the Greeks, who believed in value habituation, that the values or the virtues could be taught and learned. Or the, grand, the spiritual grandson of the Apostle Paul, Irenaeus, he actually refers to a soul-forming, soul-making process as the very plan of God for forming those bearing his image into the likeness of Christ. John of the Cross in the 16th century in his book, The Dark Night of the Soul, describes that in our darkest hours how the Christian must learn to trust in God and to turn toward God, even when God is not felt or perceived. And although not a Christian, perhaps a deist, poet John Keats coined the phrase, the veil of soul making, in a letter that he wrote to his brother and sister in 1819. In that letter, he says, call the world, if you will, the veil of soul making. Do you not see how necessary a world of pain and trouble is to school an intelligence and to make it a soul? Now, there are many other theologians more contemporary than these, Schleiermacher, C.S. Lewis, John Hick, Richard Swinburne, that all write about a soul-forming or soul-making process that is part of God's plan as he forms us and fits us for life with him. So what if Solzhenitsyn and Sitzer, Irenaeus, John of the Cross, Keats, and others are right about soul making? What if evil isn't merely evil, but it's actually an extreme hardship inside a greater good, part of God's plan A for a time of soul forming, but ultimately destroyed and vanquished when the new heavens and the new earth are established? Meanwhile, forming in us by the power of the Holy Spirit as free moral agents to deeply trust in the heart of God, in his love, and in his goodness, in the faces of all kinds of challenges and hardships, so that in the new heaven and new earth, when these things pass away, we find ourselves fit for eternity in the likeness of Christ, where an eternal weight of glory will be ours in perfect, loving, willful, trusting, abiding union with God and not just with God, but with each other, who have also been formed through these processes. We will be with Christ and like Christ. Now, I actually think that the Apostle Paul also talks about soul forming and the effect of adversity in the Christian life. He writes in the letter, in his, one of his letters to the believers in Corinth, and also in his letter to the believers in Rome, words that I've read, and you've probably read dozens of times, he writes this momentary light affliction. But when I read this most recently, thinking about our suffering and God's goodness, I took pause and it took on a deeper significance and it struck me. All of a sudden I began to think, hey, wait a minute. Think about who Paul was and where he had come from. Before his conversion, he hunted down early Christ followers with the intent to beat them, to imprison them, and perhaps to even watch them die. And as Paul encountered Christ on the other side of his conversion, he experienced the exact same types of persecution that he, merit, that he meted out on these early Christians himself. And yet he says, this momentary light affliction in light of all of this. It's like, really? Momentary light affliction? Paul, what are you thinking? What are you smoking? Right? It's like, but Paul had undergone radical belief revision. Through the adversity he encountered in the presence of God and God's people, he had come to trust that God, who broke through his false beliefs of reality, was teaching him that through pain and suffering, we can endure it far more easily when we think that it is accomplishing something better 
And he says, both in the letter to the Romans and to the letter to the Corinthians, that it is accomplishing an eternal weight of glory for us that will be revealed in the end. Or to the Corinthians, he says it's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So Paul comments on the transience of the suffering and the greater good that is being accomplished through our persevering through trial and adversity. The scriptures are really replete with similar testimonies for suffering is accomplishing great things that we may not have the clarity to see or understand when we are in the midst of them. Now, I'm not, to say, not, to, not saying that suffering should be sought out or wallowed in, but I am saying that when we are suffering, that that suffering can be redeemed. I think that if we look at the life of Jesus, if we look at the life of Job, if we read the letters from Peter or James, that we see the same ideas everywhere we go. And if we're to consider the life of Christ himself, I think we're challenged even more to rethink how we view suffering. Jesus emptied himself and took on the form of a bond slave. He was a man of sorrows, a suffering servant, and although a son made perfect through suffering. And as we consider Christ, we also see that suffering and evil were temporary, that they would one day ultimately and utterly be redeemed and would serve an eternal greater good. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, its shame and hostility, and is now seated at the right hand of God, the firstborn of a new creation. You know, arguably, there is evil. And sometimes the good is hidden within the bad or the evil that we encounter, and we may never see it, and it may not be seen by others. And all we have to do is consider the life of Job. Job never got the backstory to his story. We do. And when we consider the life of Job, I think we see how God is fitting us for eternity with him and with one another as those who, according to his plan A, will be redeemed at great personal cost to him through the life of Christ. So as I think more deeply of God's goodness and our suffering and consider the lives of Jesus and Job, again, I'm convinced that God uses suffering and adversity to form us as free moral agents through the power of the Spirit to trust more deeply in his goodness, in his heart, and in his love. And he intends for these things to pass away. So we can endure much if we know that we are not alone in our suffering. And Christianity addresses all of these needs. We are not alone. We have the presence of Christ, his life, and his companionship through our lives. We have one another, and we are to comfort one another and encourage one another with the promises of God. I think that this is part of our mystery of faith into which angels long to look. We trust the goodness of God and the heart of God regardless of our temporary circumstances. These circumstances are being used to turn our hearts away from our own judgments to the heart of a good and loving God. And that turning, that choice, is forming us to be a people for himself for eternity. So with this in mind, I believe the following possibly controversial statement is deeply true. There is no evil so great that the power of God to redeem it is not even greater. Like Job, like Phil Allen, it is our response to the, to the evil and the suffering and the adversity that we encounter that has eternal significance. And our response is part of the glory of God being revealed to those around us that exemplifies the heart of, a great, of, of the greatest lover of humanity and the greatest love story ever told. You know, there is no place that I or you could ever go, emotionally, spiritually, or physically, that God's not there, that God's not waiting for us, that he's not ready to meet us and he desires us at great personal cost. This is exemplified in the person of Jesus. No matter how great our suffering and pain, God is able to meet us in the midst of it if we will just turn to him. His presence and the presence of his children with us lightens our burdens and we lighten the burdens of others as we go in Christ's confidence to comfort and show mercy and do justice and bring hope. God promises to erase evil once the new heavens and new earth have come and 
This, all evils, will pass away and fade in light of eternity. So God is fitting us for life, for eternity with him and with one another. And that's the greater good that God is accomplishing through these light momentary afflictions. Every adversity we face is an invitation to turn toward God or to turn away. And it's only in turning toward him that we encounter hope and grow in Christ likeness. And God's glory and heart is evident to all those around us. So in these reflections, I hope you're encouraged as you consider the depth of God's heart and goodness and grow in confidence in response to the problem of evil and can join me in confidently proclaiming that God is great, God is good. Thank you.